You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Jason Brennan of the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University. He is the author of Against Democracy. Jason, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Thanks for having me. So I read the first chapter of your book, which is available online, and I'll link to it at economicsdetective.com slash democracy. In it, you paraphrase John Stuart Mill, who thought that getting more people involved in politics would make them smarter, more concerned for the common good, better educated, and nobler, whatever he meant by that. So how has Mill's hypothesis worked out in the century and a half since he came up with it? Yeah, it seems like the empirical evidence pretty overwhelmingly goes in the opposite direction, though sometimes it's hard to tease apart uh, cause and effect here. So when we look at the kinds of people who participate in politics, we find that they tend to be the most sort of ideological and biased. So for example, Diana Mutz did a study finding that if I ask you why anyone would disagree with you about politics and your answer is because they're stupid and evil, that strongly predicts that you participate heavily in politics. But if you can give a nuanced answer and explain the other side in a way that they would find flattering, that predicts you stay home. There have been a lot of empirical studies on what happens when people deliberate and so on and how they process information. And it looks really like it, it exacerbates our biases and makes us kind of meaner, more contemptuous of one another um, and so on, rather than what Mill hoped for. So you split democratic citizens into three broad categories, which you call hobbits, hooligans, and Vulcans. So uh, first, h- how did you come up with those categories and what are they? Yeah, so I wanted a shorthand way to refer to a set of psychological dispositions and things and that we could use to kind of think about democratic theory quickly. And luckily for me, it turns out two of the categories describe what people are actually like pretty well. And one is sort of an idealized category that's useful for thought experiments. So if you've read the Lord of the Rings novels or The Hobbit or you've seen the movies, you know, recognize that hobbits are kind of people that just want to go about their day-to-day lives. They don't care much about the bigger world or the bigger picture, and they just want to sort of sit home and eat their second breakfasts and that kind of stuff. So the political equivalent of that would be a person who doesn't have strong opinions about politics, doesn't think much about it, doesn't participate very often. Whatever opinion they do have is fleeting. They don't really know much about politics. They don't really care. And empirically, it looks like roughly about half of Americans are like that. And you can think of like your typical non-voter or your typical self-described moderate in the United States is probably a hobbit, so described. A hooligan, if you think about soccer hooligans, they, they know a lot about their sport, but they process information in a really biased way. So I'm a hooligan for uh, the Red Sox. So when I see a, a throw to home plate and my runner's running, I think he's safe even when the umpire thinks he's out. So sports fans tend to be really biased in the way that they process information, but they know a lot about it. And they also tend to have antagonism towards people who are fans of other teams. So like there's a Yankees-Red Sox rivalry. So in politics, a hooligan would be someone like that. For them, their political beliefs form part of their self-identity. They're proud of who they, what they believe. They tend to be much higher information, but they also tend to process information in an extremely biased way. So they only look for information that confirms their priors. They ignore or evade or dismiss out of hand information that goes against their priors. They straw man and attack the other side, and they view the people with whom they disagree as stupid and evil. And typically, when you look at the empirical work, it seems that most voting Americans and most people who belong to a political party fall pretty well into the hooligan category. And then finally, Vulcans are supposed to be dispassionate social sci- like dispassionate scientific thinkers who process information in a rational way and are not loyal to their beliefs. And it looks like very few people really fit the, the uh, Vulcan mold in actual politics. Pretty much people are either hooligans or hobbits. I think when, when we listen to that, we all want to think I'm the one Vulcan. Everyone else is a hooligan or a hobbit, but we're probably more hooligan than we'd like to admit. I certainly was more hooligan when I was younger, but I'm trying hard to be more of a Vulcan with limited success, I think. Yeah. I guess it's interesting that you picked hobbits because I I remember, is there more to that? Because I remember that in the Lord of the Rings, the hobbits were the only people who you could really trust power to I mean, because they were not going to turn around and use it for selfish gain or for evil or to destroy their enemies. Is there some significance to that? Yeah, I wish the metaphor went that that thorough. 
But, you know, even in the Lord of the Rings, when they get hold of the ring of power, that corrupts them. And Frodo doesn't want to give the ring away and it turns Smeagol into Gollum and so on. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I think in, in the real world, the people I'm calling political hobbits, they're all simply a potential hooligan. So there are a large range of empirical studies trying to find out, like, what happens when we get average citizens who don't care much about politics to participate more, to engage in deliberation with one another and so on. Results, But in general, it tends to reserve, return fairly negative results. and you can kind of think of the Hobbit as all potential hooligans in the making rather than potential Vulcans in the making. Ah, uh, that's too bad. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of, I guess, a bit of a bleak view where you know, we like to think of ourselves as Vulcans. We also like to think of Vulcans as hopefully your your swing voters would be looking at things dispassionately and wisely and, and choosing the best option. But if very few people are Vulcans, it seems like that's probably not the case. And yet, democracy seems to work pretty well. It seems to work better than the alternatives that we've seen historically. Suppose I were to walk into a random philosophy department and ask the people there what they think of democracy. What sort of arguments would I likely hear in its defense? Yeah, so I'm glad you're asking that because the kinds of arguments you get from philosophers are categorically different than the types of arguments you would get from an economist or political scientist. And Part of the reason I'm writing this book is that I'm, I'm just very dissatisfied with the type of work philosophers are doing on democracy. So, you know, if you ask, a, like, and this, I know this isn't really your question directly, but if you ask a political scientist or an economist why democracy works, they're likely to point to empirical results about how prosperous they are, how stable they, they tend to be. And they would probably, likely recognize that they have a lot of internal flaws and then just say, but they still work pretty well. When you go to philosophers, though, they're working with a model of democracy where they're almost writing as if they assume everyone is a Vulcan or likely to be one. And they give these highly idealized accounts of how democracy is supposed to run, which has very little resemblance to what actually happens in real-world democracy. And I think part of the reason is that most professional political philosophers have maybe only taken two social science classes in their entire lives when they were, say, first semester undergraduates, and that's it. They haven't read anything since then. So they focus heavily on deontological or symbolic arguments, meaning that they try to argue that democracy is inherently just, and they'll say that it makes us more autonomous, that it empowers us, that it's necessary to prevent us from being dominated, or they'll say that democracy has symbolic value because to have a democracy signals and publicly symbolizes the idea that every human being is equal and is just for that reason. Yeah, I'm more aware of the economics arguments. I believe what the sort of verdict is that democracies they don't have the highest growing countries and they don't have the lowest growing countries, but they have very low variance. So if you want just consistent, you know, slow, but steady economic growth, then democracy is a pretty good model. But autocracies can grow very fast or they can... Yeah. And they don't have famine. As a- yes, yes. They don't, they don't have utter collapse and, you know, Venezuela style... Well, I guess Venezuela is sort of a democracy officially on paper, but yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that you see a lot is people talk about democracy and freedom as if they were interchangeable concepts. So what's wrong with that? Yeah. I mean, so if I have the right to vote, that is a kind of freedom. Um, it gives me a small amount of power to do something. I'm allowed to go to a, a church near my house and check a box um, once every couple of years. I mean, if I don't have the right to vote, I don't have that particular freedom. But it's weird to make a big deal out of that because when uh, there is debate in economics and political science about how, how effective a vote is, what's the probability that your vote will make a difference. And so one popular model, uh, the Bren Lemaski model, is kind of based on the mathematics of thinking about a weighted coin flip and what's the likelihood that it'll come up heads a certain number of times. On that model, the chances you're being decisive are in most major national elections in the U.S. is like vanishingly small. It's on the order of like you winning Powerball a couple of times. Um, another model that's more popular now, due to some work by Gelman and Kaplan and a few others, says that you have a higher chance of being decisive, but even then only if you're voting for one of the two major parties and only if you live in a swing state, which I do, I live in Northern Virginia. So my vote, according to their model, has something like a one in 20 million chance of being decisive. It's weird to think that that's a big kind of freedom, though. Um, so you think about, say, the freedom of speech, like the freedom to choose what you read, or if you walk into a restaurant and you order something. This is a case where you have close to unilateral decision-making power over your own life and giving you civil liberties and most economic liberties is allowing you to be sort of autonomous in an obvious sense. You get to choose what you eat and what you consume. And when you make the decision, you get what you decide. When it comes to democracy, even on like the more optimistic models, your power is so vanishingly small, it's weird to think that it would matter that much to you. 
in a sense, that's what democracy is supposed to be. It's not supposed to empower individuals. It's supposed to empower a collective, the majority of the moment. Yeah, well, there's something called the paradox of voting, which is if people only have, you know, at, at best, a one in 20 million shot at affecting the election, why do they vote at all? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so it's clear from surveys that people don't think their votes are likely to be decisive. They don't really know exactly the probability. I mean, there's disagreement when you get surveys. It's like some people think they have a higher chance, some people have a very interesting small chance, but it's, they don't believe that it's because they're going to be decisive, that that's why they're voting. It seems to be more like a large percentage of people at least claim in surveys, and there is a social desirability bias here, which might influence their answers, but they at least claim in surveys that they believe they have a duty to vote, and so they're voting for that reason. But there's also stuff like people like to do collective activities. I think that's just a natural preference people have. They like to participate in things. So, you know, at a sports stadium, people will do the wave. And it's not like most people doing the wave think that, like, it's like they just want the wave to happen. And they're, they're only participating because they think they're likely to be pivotal. Pivotal, I'm sorry. That's not likely the case. It's just we like doing stuff collectively. So participating in a national election is kind of like this big show and you're participating with others. And people, I think, just like that. It's just their preference. You might say they have a taste for voting, I guess. Yeah, and I guess if you think of something like calling in to vote for the winner of American Idol, then it's even more clear that it, there's a sort of, there's a fun to it. Yeah, yeah, and actually uh, we know that some empirical confirmation of that is the biggest predictor of whether you vote or not is simply whether you think politics is interesting. So when we ask, do you think politics is interesting? If you say yes, you probably vote. If you say no, you probably don't. Okay. And so there's this element of, I mean, we talked about the hooligans before, there's this element of identity and fitting into your group. And so for a lot of people, maybe their social life is sort of, their social life and their social connections are maybe dependent on participating in things like voting and tribal sort of signaling activities. Yeah, I think that's right. So in your book, you propose a potential alternative to democracy that you call epistocracy. So could you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. So a democracy is sort of by definition a system in which the fundamental political power is distributed equally among all citizens. Um, of course, what counts as a citizen is a complicated question. Whereas an epistocracy is a system that formally through law tries to distribute political power on the basis of knowledge or competence. So the idea here is that there's a lot of empirical work on what voters know and what they don't know. There's been 60 years of research on this, and it overwhelmingly finds that the vast majority of voters are maybe really worse than ignorant. Like ignorant, Ignorance would be an improvement for them. Um, they make systematic mistakes on a lot of basic questions. Their estimates about basic facts are just way off. They often, they don't even know, I mean, they, they pretty much know who the president is and not much else beyond that. So in an epistocracy, what you would do is, one way or another, the degree to which you have knowledge in some way impacts how much power you have. So there's a wide range of different types of epistocracy, some of which are, are perhaps more worth considering or trying out than others. So one form of epistocracy is simply no one gets the right to vote unless they can pass some sort of basic test of political knowledge. So in the same way that you don't get the right to drive unless you can pass a driver competence exam, you don't get the right to vote unless you can say pass the American national election exam or the American civic uh, citizenship test. Another system would be one in which everyone gets the right to vote, but you can acquire additional rights to vote, like maybe two or three votes if you can pass such an exam. You could have a system in which all legislation is passed through a democratic legislature, but you have panels of experts or panels of epistocrats that have the power to veto incompetently decided legislation in the same way that the Supreme Court can veto democratic legislation. You could have a system proposed by a philosopher named Claudio Lopez Guerra, who says, what if we had a system in which we have a lottery right before the election takes place? We have a lottery. We pick out, say, 10 or 20,000 Americans. They and only they are allowed to vote. And it's done randomly, so there's no sort of bias towards race or anything like that. But then before they're actually allowed to vote, they have to go through some sort of minimal competence building exercise, and then they vote, and that decides the election. Or finally, a system that I, I think would be really interesting to try is what I call government by simulated oracle. And so what you do is you allow everyone to vote, but when they vote, they they're given a series of questions about their political preferences. They're given a series of questions about who they are demographically. And then they're given a quiz of very basic political knowledge, such as what's, what percent of the budget is spent on uh, defense or who's the current president or which party controls Congress. And then when you have that information, you collect that in mass, you can then statistically determine with like second semester statistics what the American public would want if only it were fully informed. 
And then the idea is you implement that rather than their actual preferences. So this is called calculating a person, the country's enlightened preferences. And the reason you get their demographic information is because then you're able to tell how does race or income or employment status or religion impact their preferences. And we can keep that constant and kind of control for it while uh, figuring out what they would want if they were better informed. Okay, so if one group on average is better informed, you don't want to put more weight on that group's well-informed preferences. So controlling for the demographics we think are important would then, you know, if we if we did it right, it would put the appropriate weight on each group. It seems like yeah. people would maybe fight over which group identities to include in the regression because I guess if your group is relatively more informed, then you don't want to be accounted for because that'll reduce your weight. But if your group is relatively less informed, then you do want to be accounted for because that increases your weight. I guess with any system, we can sort of go into the details of what yeah. you know, what kind of things we would all fight over. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would, I'd like to keep it pretty basic and use things like what we have on the census already because that's been useful. And I think it's clear that any kind of system like this, people are going to try to rig it for their own benefit. Parties will try to control it for their own benefit. In the same way that they do in democracy, they gerrymander, they try to control the voting age and things like that for their own benefit. So one way of thinking about this is I'm not trying to push for a uh, utopian proposal that this is the end of history that would solve all their problems. I have a, my view is pretty much that the question about whether we should use a democracy or epistocracy is, is sort of like asking whether a hammer or, or a wrench is better. It's just like neither, neither one's a perfect tool, but the question is just which one works better in the end. Yeah, and you, you mentioned how the, the Supreme Court has a veto, which in some ways is like the faculty on elite law schools have a veto over the laws passed in the United States because, of course, you know, the Supreme Court is appointed by the president, but from an elite pool of lawyers and judges. Another example would be the the Federal Reserve Board, which is selected from a pool of elite uh, bankers and economists. So are these institutions, you know, somewhat I guess, epistocratic already? And do you think they function fairly well? Yeah, I think they are epistocratic. And, and overall, I mean, you know, there are these studies trying to ask, like, has the Fed actually managed to stabilize the economy over 90 years? And there's a debate about, on that. And I don't want to enter into that one way or another. I think more economists think that they have and than haven't. But it's true that these are epistocratic institutions. And in a sense, democracy already has a lot of epistocratic institutions. So political parties serve as epistocratic checks. You can see that the democratic party kept Bernie Sanders down because they didn't like his politics and populist voters were pushing for him, relatively low information voters were pushing for him. Um, though there are also a lot of high information voters among college faculty, like really left wing faculty liked him as well. And they were able to kind of keep a check on him. Martin Gillens, who's a political scientist at Princeton, has a, a really nice book that came out in 2012 called Affluence and Influence. And in it, he says that contrary to the consensus view that the median voter is who decides uh, what happens in politics. He says that quite frequently, um, higher income voters have more power, roughly about six times more influence on what democracies do than the median voter, not always, but in certain situations. And he himself is kind of torn by that because he says, on one hand, he's a small D Democrat and he feels like this is sort of unfair. But on the other hand, when he looks at the policy preferences of high versus low income voters, he recognizes that empirically, it turns out high income voters tend to be very high information and low income voters tend to be very low information. And this changes what they support. So high income slash high information voters are more in favor of civil rights. They're more in favor of free trade. They think more like economists. And low information voters have the exact opposite preferences. So yeah, I think in a sense, and I have a section on this in the book that says, there's a sense in which democracy works pretty well, in part because it doesn't work, because we already have these epistocratic checks that prevent the median voter who is kind of systematically misinformed from just getting his or her way. Okay, so we're almost in a bit of a hybrid system right now. And so what you're proposing isn't to yeah. throw out the current system, but to expand the elements of it that put more weight on the well-informed. Yeah, that's right. In a sense, that's my claiming that isn't all that controversial, because you can see if you go to, say, read philosophical democratic theory, you'll see many of them complaining about the Supreme Court. They'll say, you know, how dare the Supreme Court veto democratic legislation? And they recognize there's some tension there because that forces them to say things like, well, if the majority votes to remove the rights of a minority, I guess they can do that. Or if the majority votes to have a war for no good reason, I guess they can do that. And so there is this tension with philosophers. 
There's a very popular view among philosophers called pure proceduralism, which is the view that anything a democracy does is just simply because the democracy decided to do it. And with a little bit of, of ingenuity, you can think of some horrific possible counterexamples to that thesis. And a lot of them have to bite the bullet and, and say, yes, if a democracy decides to legalize horrible things, then I guess it's okay. Right. I suppose you didn't do this, but you could have made the cover of your book, Two Wolves and a Sheep Lining Up at a Ballot Box. Yeah, that's right. One reason, though, I think, you know, there's something misleading about that. And if you ask most people how they vote, like if I ask a person, how do you vote? They say, well, I vote for justice and peace in the American way. And then you ask, well, how do other people vote? And they say, oh, they're all selfish bastards who vote their pocketbooks. <laughs> and most people are right about themselves and wrong about everybody else. So one of the surprising findings, and I, I wasn't aware of this until about 10 years ago when I started studying it, one of the surprising findings in political science is that voters tend to be altruistic in their modus, um, which is surprising because people are selfish for the most part in their day-to-day -day lives. But if you think about the paradox of voting, it becomes more obvious why they would do that. If you were a genuine selfish sociopath who was really good at calculating probabilities and trying to promote your self-interest, you would almost never vote. You would just stay home and play video games or eat popcorn. Because, you know, if Trump offers me, say, $10 million, credibly promises me $10 million if he's elected, it's now $10 million to me for him to be elected. But voting for him, I, since I have such a small chance of being decisive, it's not even worth my time to cast a vote. It might even be likely that I'd be more likely, it's possible I'm more likely to die from a car accident on the way to the polls than I am to be the decisive voter. So, you know, in the same way, winning a lottery is, is a big deal, but a lottery ticket's pretty close to worthless. So for that reason, it looks like voters, when they vote, they're trying to express their fidelity to their worldview, to their sense of justice. And there's even some experimental evidence of this. Some uh, political scientists at MIT and Harvard did a study where they were varying the probability people would be decisive in a laboratory setting when they were either could either vote selfishly or for the collective good. And if I remember correctly, it's something like when you have about a one in a hundred chance or higher of being decisive, you vote selfishly. And when it's lower than that, you vote for the common good rather than for your self-interest. Okay. So yeah. And that jives with my intuition that if you're doing something that is not consequential, then it, it makes a lot of sense to use that as an opportunity to show what a good person you are, or how committed you are to your group identity. Right. You might, you might say something like, the issue with democracy isn't motivation. Uh, people measure up really well. Both sides mean well. Everybody cares about their country and they vote accordingly. It's, it's really a cognitive problem. It's what they know. Yeah. And I suppose the, the big issue is that people know more about their own self-interest than they do about the common good. So it might be actually a sort of perverse thing in some sense that they don't vote more in their self-interest. Yeah, I think you're right about that. So there's a large body of literature in poli-sci and actually economics, if you look at the public choice literature, where they're trying to calculate how politics would go if everyone were a sort of maximally rational sociopath. And it's clear that it would actually go pretty well. It's surprising it wouldn't be a disaster. There'd be a lot of like vote trading and interest trading and compromise. And we get fairly good results that would promote the interests of most people if that happened. And in a sense, it would be better if it were like that, because there's reason to think that dumb altruists are worse than selfish, smart people. So in a sense, like democracy would be best if it were a bunch of smart altruists. But the actual dilemma we have is between selfish, smart people versus dumb altruists and dumb altruists may be the worst possible outcome. Right, because you're trying to do good things to other people, but you don't know anything about their lives or the effects of the policies that you think are going to help them. And then you just sort of blindly crush them under the wheels of some ill thought out policy. Yeah, exactly. Things that sound good, things that symbolize your concern, but you don't pay attention to whether it actually works. Yeah. So I have a sort of different defense of democracy I wanted to bounce off you. So Ludwig von Mises argued that in the long run, the majority of citizens will get what they want. And if you tried to impose something else on them, even if that something else were better, then they'd just take what they want by force. So he had sort of the weak defense of democracy, which is it's a good system because even though it doesn't lead to the best outcomes, at least it reaches those outcomes without political violence and bloodshed. Someone even once asked Mises at a party, you know, what would you do if you were a dictator? To which he responded, I would abdicate. So my question to you is, did, was he giving the right answer there? I think he's saying it too strongly, but I think he's on to something. No, I'm not sure how strong this effect is. So you might call the, the technical term, I think, that he's, for what he's referring to is Weberian legitimacy after uh, Max Weber. 
And it's the idea that like the functioning of a system depends upon it being perceived as legitimate by the people subject to it. And there's reason to think that democracies have more of this kind of legitimacy than other types of systems. Notice I'm not I'm not saying they're in fact legitimate. I'm not making a normative claim. I'm just making an empirical claim about how people react to them. So there's this worry that any kind of epistocratic system would be perceived as less legitimate, and in the long run, maybe it would be less stable. I'm not sure if that's... I've been trying to look at literature on that, and it's clear that like democracies do better compared to some other forms, other types of systems, but I don't know if we really know if that's true of ep- epistocracy. You know, Singapore does pretty well, and they're, they're quite epistocratic compared to, say, the United States. And here are a couple other reasons to be somewhat scale of that. But again, I'm, I'm not, I don't think I can definitively refute it or say one way or the other. Um, part of the issue here is the majority doesn't really know that much what's going on. So when we look at, are the, are the, is the majority able to engage in retrospective voting? The idea of like, throw the bastards out if the bastards do a good job. Well, you, you can kind of come up with a set of a checklist of, well, what would the majority need to know in order to throw out the bastards who are doing a good job? They need to know things like which bastards were actually in power. It turns out they don't know that. Or what were they able to do? And it turns out they don't know that. Or what were their options? And they don't know that. They're very short-sighted. The, the memory of the American public is only about three months long when it comes to assessing politics. So there's, that's part of the reason why there's so much independence in the first place of, about what governments do, because they can kind of get away with doing things and, and no one will catch them on it. So for that reason, I'm wondering if maybe an epistocracy, as long as you have a fairly wide voting group, I mean, not, not literally everyone voting, but still like voting is distributed pretty widely, perhaps it would avoid the problems that dictatorships face. Right. And if everyone has the same chance to write this, if they're writing a test to get them either the right to vote or the right to have three votes instead of one, there's still a sense that we choose our government. And so I I can see it, yeah. people not only consenting to the system, but then feeling like they are part of it, especially. And given that the ones who care most will be the ones who take the effort to write the test, I don't see the people who didn't care enough to write the test, caring enough to stage a coup or something. Yeah, I think it's, especially if it's fairly widespread and the test is fairly basic. If it's over, you know, so suppose you made the test the equivalent of like econ 101, which I think in some sense would be really helpful if we did, because survey data kind of shows that the view that Adam Smith is arguing against in the wealth of nations that he calls a mercantilism, that is the dominant economic philosophy of the American public. There are a bunch of mercantilists. So it's like 220 years of economic work and like we haven't made a difference uh, on the American public. So it'd be nice if it were an econ 101 exam, but that would be seen as ideological. Like, like my sociologist friends think that economics is a highly ideological discipline. And of course, their own discipline isn't. Whereas my economist friends think that sociology is just applied Marxism and economics is the only non-ideological discipline. So that stuff's going to be in dispute. So if you just make it, you know, basic question, which party controls Congress, how much is spent on foreign aid, roughly, was the unemployment rate going up or down? These are things that they're, in a sense, not ideological, but it does turn out empirically that your ability to answer them greatly modifies the kinds of views that you have. And it doesn't really make people go in a particularly partisan way. It doesn't make them go pro-Democrat or pro-Republican. It, it sort of like kind of goes all over. In a sense. So it, it doesn't clearly predict the partisanship, but maybe individual policy preferences? Yeah. So there's sort of three off the top of my head, I can think of like three people that have done the method of kind of calculating the public's enlightened preferences where you, again, I was saying we should actually consider using this as a voting system, but you, you look at what they want, who they are and what they know. And then you calculate what they would want, keeping, keeping the demographic information the same, calculate what they would want if they were full. Uh, in his book, Brian Kaplan, in his book, and Skull Althaus, in his book, Democratic Preferences, or Collective Preferences in Democratic Politics, they find interestingly that high information people, regardless of income, become more pro-free trade and start having the kinds of attitudes that economists have, which I think is, is interesting, right? Like it's, it's a surprising empirical, it's not made by the method, but that's, that's what would happen. So yeah, with an epistocracy, I think the idea here is the rule of the many, but it's not the rule of everybody, whereas democracy is supposed to be the rule of everybody. When most people, they think about epistocracy, what they imagine is like a philosopher king, and they think, well, philosopher kings would be a disaster, so epistocracy is a bad idea, but that's, that's taking like the least plausible version of it. What's the best objection you've heard to your views? Good. So here are two objections, and, and these are all in the book. I haven't encountered a new objection that isn't in the book and that I try to answer in one way or another. But one objection is that we know right now that there are tremendous racial disparities in terms of basic political knowledge. Um, this, isn't, this is because of background structural injustice in the United States and so on. So if you take 
say the quiz that's the American National Election Studies, like they got, they, every two years they ask people what they know, people's ability to answer that quiz depends heavily on their on race. And, and it's heavily correlated with things like race and income, employment status. And so we can say things like a middle-aged white employed man is likely to score two and a half times higher than an unemployed young black woman. So there's a worry that in an epistocracy, what would happen, in, at least in certain versions of it, is that political power would be apportioned according to advantage rather than, and would have sort of racial disparities that are in some way repugnant. So there's a couple of responses to that. One is there's a few types of epistocratic systems, the simulated oracle one and the what's called the enfranchisement lottery that avoid that altogether. But even then, I think the issue here is we should fix the underlying structural injustices, which rather than worry so much about the symptoms, we should actually look at the, the root cause. And it's important to keep in mind that like white people, white people vote for what they perceive to be the national interest. Black people vote for what they perceive to be the national interest. Everyone votes for what they perceive to be the national interest. And the goal here is to try to find a system that makes it so knowledge is more effective rather than just simple identity. Um, another objection that I put it sort of towards the end of the book is what I call the conservative argument for democracy. And that is based on Edmund Burke, which says, or, or Michael Oxshott, that says that experimenting with new forms of government is extremely risky. We philosophers and social scientists, we don't really know much about how institutions work. If an institution has persisted for a couple hundred years, that's evidence that it works really well. Sitting in our armchairs, we're likely to come up with dumb policies that have unintended, consequ- unintended consequences and make things worse. And so it might say it's not even worth experimenting with epistocracy. It's, we should just keep what we have because it works well enough and why worry about doing something better. So I guess that could apply to the novel ideas that people come up with under democracy as well. So th- doesn't it sort of cut against itself in a sense? Yeah, there's a sense in which this kind of argument, which you could also call a precautionary argument, it's it complied everything. You can say, like, let's not legalize gay marriage because perhaps the institution of marriage will be destroyed and we don't understand how it works. Let's not open up careers to women for this reason. You can apply it to pretty much anything. So I think the wisdom of this argument is that it's true that we're dumb. It's true that there are unintended consequences. So there's a sense in which we should try changes kind of gradually and see what happens. So towards the end of the book, I say, like, if I were given, if I were made dictator, I wouldn't impose epistocracy on the United States overnight. And I would rather, I want to experiment with seeing how it works in relatively non-corrupt and stable um, states. So try it out in New Hampshire before trying it out in Louisiana, or try it out in Switzerland before trying it out in France, or certainly before trying it out in Venezuela. And then if it works on a small scale, scale it up. And if it doesn't work, try something else. But yeah, you're right. The, the kind of Burkean argument can be used for any possible change. It, it it's not clear why it doesn't just say, keep the status quo and do nothing. Well, there's also Chesterton's fence, which is sort of like that, but it's just, you need to understand why the fence is there, and then you can get rid of it. You're not held to a standard of never getting rid of a fence once it appears. Yeah, that's a better way of thinking, I think. I guess there's a sort of skepticism about rationalism and the idea that like, sometimes there are these institutions that they, they exist for a reason and they serve a purpose. But when we try to think about what purpose they serve, we can't quite figure it out. So we conclude that they're useless institutions and we get rid of them. And then, oops, once we get rid of them, we find out that actually it was very useful. That's, that's sort of the conservative argument. And given the kind of epistemic skepticism it starts with, there's a sense in which you can never really refute it a priori. You can only find out after the fact whether it was right or not. Right. So the incremental change would help you to minimize the potential downside of trying new things. Yeah, hopefully that's the idea. Do you have any closing thoughts? Sure. So I think you're asking the kinds of questions that a social scientist would ask, and those are important questions, and I think philosophers don't pay enough attention to them. But I think there is this real big normative question about what kind of value democracy has. And I have a a metaphor for this to say, when you think about the value of a hammer, you think of it in purely instrumental terms, and no one would ever insist on using a hammer when there's a better hammer available or when a wrench would work better. When you think about the value of a painting, you tend to think of a but, but it's symbolic value, or you value it because of who made it. And when you think about the value of a person, we tend to say that they're ends in themselves. So there's a deep philosophical question here about what kind of value does democracy have? Does it have, merely have the value that a hammer has, or does it also have the value that a painting and a person has? So most of my philosophical colleagues are convinced that democracy has a value of a painting and a person. And what I'm trying to do here is convince them it's merely a hammer. And if we can find a better hammer, feel free to use it. My guest today has been Jason Brennan. Jason, thanks for being on Economics Detective Radio. Thank you for having me. 
As I mentioned early in the show, you can go to economicsdetective.com slash democracy for my show notes page, which will include links to all the studies that Jason mentioned, as well as to the book itself and to its first chapter, which is available from the publisher's website. Thanks for listening. I really appreciate all of you who give me your time and your attention, whether it's on your commute to work or wherever you listen to Economics Detective Radio. If you really enjoy the show, especially since we've reformatted and gone to a weekly show, I hope you can do us a favor by either posting on Facebook or Twitter or coming to the website and leaving a comment. I like to hear what you think of each episode and what you learned and maybe what you'd like to see in future episodes. So head on over to economicsdetective.com slash democracy for show notes and give us a like or a share on Facebook if you feel we've earned it. Thanks very much. 